Salt and Light's media ministry would not be possible without your generosity. Join our Guardian program and become a monthly donor today. Brothers and sisters in Christ, in this solemn rite of dedication, let us ask the Lord our God to bless this water created by his hand. As it is sprinkled upon us, make it a sign of the saving waters of baptism, by which we become one in Christ, the temple of your spirit. My direction to the architect was rather general and broad. I said, this needs to breathe Catholic. This is who we are. And I said, it also must be beautiful. Not ostentatious or luxurious, but it must be beautiful because our faith is beautiful. tell you a little bit about what we were hoping to achieve with the design which is a balance between history and tradition and modern and forward thinking and I think it, it has the, a Romanesque proportion to it the, the, the simple straight walls the high volume the curved um, end of, of the chapel really evoke some of those traditional Roman basilicas that, that really represent the history the tradition the, the, the grandeur of, of the church the basic structure of, of the chapel is a basilica, the most ancient Christian structure possible. When the, the faith became public, when we came out of the catacombs, we adopted the Roman public buildings. So uh, this is the most ancient form of a church in the form of our church here. And in fact, the way the, the chapel itself is situated in the overall architecture of the seminary, uh, the whole structure becomes basilica shape. Balanced with that is, is a very contemporary interpretation, clean white concrete walls, freestanding curving forms that embrace the, the sanctuary and allow the play of light um, across the walls and animate the space. And I think there's a, a warmth to it um, and a grounding and an uplifting feeling. So a very, very traditional shaped chapel, very traditional materials, the concrete, all done in a single pour, We're going to be here forever. Uh, surrounded though by this glass skin so that the chapel kind of pours out of itself into the rest of the building the stone floors, the wood finishes. There are all these different elements that make it seem eternal if you want, not so transitory, not so modern that 10 years from now we're gonna look back and go, oh, that was built in the 1970s, wasn't it? Throughout our, our tradition, uh, anointing with oil signifies a setting apart for a particular purpose. In this case, of course, the worship of God. That is symbolized by the anointing of the altar, which represents in a particularly wondrous way uh, the presence of Christ, who is our rock, and we turn to him for, as our secure foundation. But also it's, it's extended by anointing the walls. This, the entirety of the place is 
set aside as a place for the worship of God. Personally for me, and I believe for many other seminarians, being here and living in this building uh, encourages us to, to realize how beautiful the gospel is and how we ourselves are called to become also beautiful so we can radiate that beauty to others. I think the new building will encourage people to discern and to think about the priesthood as young people, young men drive by the building just by looking at how beautiful it is, they will probably ask themselves what's happening inside there. My own vocational story began in my family. I I firmly believe that God used my family to call me to the priesthood. I come from a fairly large family. We are 16 siblings, 11 boys and 5 sisters. I was constantly helping my little siblings, taking care of them, helping them with their homework, uh, assisting them in, in little things. And I quickly realized how beautiful it was to, to, to give myself to them. So when I finished high school, when I was trying to decide which path to choose, uh, I came to, to realize that the priesthood is all about giving myself completely to others. And I decided to, to give it a try. Seminary life sometimes can seem to be difficult and hard, and I think that's normal, that's natural. But at the same time, it is also very rewarding because you're constantly praying and being close to Christ. Uh, the community that is formed in the seminary is very similar to the community of the first disciples that gathered around our Lord. I think one of the proudest things for us, um, if pride is the appropriate word, is the way that the stained glass windows have a place in, in this chapel. They were moved from the 1957 chapel on St. Albert Trail. They're absolutely uh, one of our greatest treasures in the seminary in terms of uh, what we had there as religious art and architecture. And uh, we wanted to reuse them in the chapel. We looked at how to do that though, and one of the things we had an opportunity to do was to re-situate and re-envision them. Uh, the windows are, there are 14 very large windows, seven sacraments, and the seven steps to the priesthood as that existed at the time uh, before the council. We took different elements, like for example the seminary crests that were laid in the terraza tile of the old seminary floor. Uh, we weren't sure we would be able to save them, and in fact it was quite, quite a job, but they were able to do that, transfer them, repair them, and make them a thing of beauty again. The cross for the crucifix, I prayed with that crucifix for 25 years. I was really, really uh, desirous of seeing that have the same kind of prominence and centrality that it always did have in our seminary. goes back to 1918, the presence of a seminary here. And from that time, it has been the, the, the property of the Archdiocese of Edmonton, owned and operated, but has always opened its doors to, primarily, uh, seminarians for the dioceses of Western Canada. I think there is a long history of uh, the Diocese of Saskatoon sending seminarians here for formation. Uh, we are a neighboring diocese next province over, but uh, our boundaries touch. And uh, at the present, there are two uh, seminarians uh, from the Diocese of Saskatoon here. And uh, there will be a third uh, seminarian from the diocese coming here uh, next fall. One of the things that is distinctive, I think, about St. Joseph's is that it truly is 
a regional seminary. And in the past, the Diocese of Calgary has had seminarians in many different seminaries. And uh, we made a commitment consciously about 10 years ago to really support a seminary in the West. So it only made sense to me that we should be looking at uh, a distinct seminary that should serve this Western kind of culture and Western reality because this is the area in which we're going to have to proclaim the gospel and our priests are going to have to serve the people of this region. The city is expanding um, rapidly. Uh, they're building a ring road around the city called the Anthony Hendy Highway and we were the only building in the way of the highway. Uh, so the government entered into negotiations to relocate us, though it involved a, a certain amount of grief because we loved our own buildings and, uh, and we had been there a long time. It's been a journey in the desert in a sense to see a beloved old home that for 40 years for the college and 50 years for the seminary was a place of formation and was a landmark for the whole of the Edmonton Catholic community and the whole city destroyed to see that happen was a sadness and a lot of people grieved over that. now to see this beautiful uh, monument to God's glory, to the generosity of the people of Edmonton and to uh, the deep uh, commitment of the part of the church to the future of ministry in the church is remarkable. For it stands in scripture, see I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Incense always a symbol of our prayers rising to God. So the incense uh, burner was placed onto the altar uh, as, a, as a symbols of our prayers surrounding the altar, surrounding this entire space. And in fact, all the people were incensed as well. So the symbol of, of, of Christ's holiness uh, surrounding us and us taken up into his prayer to the Father. The bishop, when we were talking about the design, uh, as a design team, was very clear that he wanted the Eucharist to be the very center of all the seminary life. I said, look, we are a people for whom the Eucharist is the center, it is the summit, and it is the source of all that we do. I want that reflected in this building. Because here we are forming uh, men for service as priests in the center of their lives, of course, is the celebration of the Eucharist. And he didn't want the chapel to be a building enclosed in itself off in the corner that we go and visit for a few moments and then forget about the rest of the time, which unfortunately is sometimes what we do with God. And he certainly didn't want that to be what happened in formation. And the architect, Donna Clare, did it by the means of this, uh, of this modern architecture. She did that by the centrality of the chapel itself in relation to the rest of the seminary, as well as by the centrality within the chapel of the Blessed Sacrament, of the tabernacle. So wherever we are, we see Christ present sacramentally, we hear his call, we can't ever forget where we're at. Well, I love the, the centrality of the chapel, just having that kind of always as a focus when you're going through a a lousy day and you can't help but pass by the chapel to get to your room and you're, you're reminded every time you pass through that the Blessed Sacrament is there. This is my third year in the seminary and the hope would be to be ordained a priest. In junior high and high school it was kind of out of the question, there was no chance that that was ever going to happen for me. I had my mind set, on, set pretty early on in junior high to be a doctor 
Uh, in my second year of university, I was asked to help coordinate a youth group at my parish, the Life Teen Group, through seeing the faith of the high school students who had a much stronger faith than I ever did in high school, kind of motivated me to kind of go deeper into my faith life and really try and develop it. And then there was a time I was praying in front of the Blessed Sacrament and at that time there was just kind of an overwhelming sense that maybe I should consider the priesthood. And at this time I was in the middle of my relationship with my girlfriend and I was very happy and had no desire to leave it. Um, I kind of made an ultimatum with God at that point saying, well, if this is what you want for me, then you're going to have to make it happen because I'm not going to do anything about it right now. So over time, I grew apart with my girlfriend and at that point, it was, I kind of remembered that ultimatum that I had made with God. I was able to make the decision that if I was going to take this discernment seriously, I needed to take the next step, which was to enter the seminary and that's what I did. Jesus said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. Duke in alto, put out into the deep. Here, we are training men to be priests of the new evangelization sent into the deep waters of our day under the direction of Jesus Christ. The faith of the people here is strong. They have a great hope for the future, and they love Christ and the church, and they love the people of this world, and they're, they're wanting to send out preachers of the gospel for the future. Um, not a few people have sacrificed to make that possible. The Cornerstone of Faith campaign was um, a campaign that brought together the people of the Archdiocese to look at raising the 15 million that was needed to complete the building of uh, the seminary in Newman Theological College. It was really overwhelming the support by the Catholic community and others who showed no matter how big or small their love of the church and their love of God in the future. We certainly were grateful to the Knights of Columbus, the CWL, and a few um, of the family donations um, like the Allards and the Melton family for making our campaign come to conclusion. We've uh, been supporting the campaign uh, very, very uh, vigorously. And so a lot of the funding that we're giving that we're asking our individual members to give is being focused towards the chapel to furnish it and uh, do whatever is necessary here. And it's named after Our Lady of Good Counsel, who is our patroness. Uh, other financial ways that we've contributed is through the other dioceses here in Alberta. And our Edmonton Diocese is supplying the volunteers who are going to work the library and uh, we've even contributed to this documentary because we think it's very important to have the history and to be able to share that with all of our members. Well, a couple of years ago, uh, we, uh, we were talking with Archbishop Smith and uh, we pledged that we'd raise a uh, million dollars. We, we made it over a million and then our supreme headquarters from New Haven, Connecticut, donated another 100,000, so we're over 1.1 million in the end. Well, we're so pleased that Archbishop Smith said that if we did raise the million dollars, uh, he would name the bell tower after the Venerable Father Michael McGivney, the founder of the Knights of Columbus. And so he's done that now. So a lovely tower you see in the background here is the McGivney Tower. The church is exalted, a city set on a mountain, a beacon to the whole world, bright with glory of the Lamb and echoing the prayers of her saints. Lord, send your spirit from heaven to make this church an ever holy place and this altar a ready table for the sacrifice of Christ. What 
was unique about what was happening is that, for example, when we came in, the altar was not vested, was not uh, used, was not, there were no candles, again, like a, a child being brought forth for baptism. began with me receiving the Paschal candle, which is the presence of the risen Lord, He as the light of the world, and then taking the light from that one Paschal candle to the altar candles, as well as to the various stational candles of the consecration stones, uh, was also beautifully symbolic of our call, our mission, to be agents of that spreading of the light of Christ, the light that He is, the hope that He is, uh, to all peoples of the world. The former uh, seminary facility, together with Newman College, was quite a distance north of the city. Now we have the seminary and the college situated right on the grounds of our pastoral center in the very center of the city, uh, high on a hill, high on the riverbank, overlooking the riverbank towards downtown. This new campus, which is what we refer to this conglomeration of communities that are here, that is now made up of the seminary, the college, and the archdiocesan pastoral offices, provides at the core of Edmonton Literally, at one of the highest spots in the whole of the city, a place where the cross of Jesus stands atop that bell tower, proclaiming to the world that Christ Jesus is the truth and the way and the life. The fraternity that we've built between the seminary, the college, and the pastoral center all of this is on one campus. And so it has given rise to a, to a very unique culture within the Archdiocese where we all come to know each other and, and as a result of that, we come to support each other in our vocation. I, I, was, I grew up in a non-Catholic family and I was in seventh grade and one day I finished my homework early in study hall and so I, I asked for a library pass. And I was looking at some books on Christianity, and I saw this thin book called The Catholic Priest. It was a picture book from the 50s. And in this book were photographs of priests doing different things, counseling people, celebrating the sacraments, and, and exercising different forms of piety. And I was intrigued by that. And so I decided that this is probably what I want to do with my life. And so, of course, if I wanted to become a priest, I had to become a Catholic. So in 1993, I was baptized into the Catholic faith. And shortly thereafter, I began my journey to where I am today. There are about 129,000 deaf Catholics in Canada. There are no deaf priests in Canada. Being a deaf priest for deaf people, I think, is, can better enunciate an invitation for deaf people to develop a friendship with God. And of course, there's, there's the more obvious aspect of celebrating the sacraments in sign language and preaching in sign language. I began to work for the deaf community while studying as a lay student at Newman. And I knew that having an archbishop who was familiar with the deaf community from his time in Halifax would be very helpful in forging that relationship between the deaf community here in Edmonton and the Archdiocese. Eventually, the archbishop invited me to consider staying here in Edmonton. And of course, at that meeting, we were communicating in sign language. So there's, a, there's an understanding between us that I am sure not many deaf priests would have with their own bishop. 
Exequit seminat. The sower went out to sow. We know the great mystery of the parable of the sower in which the Lord speaks of the spread of the kingdom. It's uh, from that Latin that we have our term seminary. So the seminary itself is a, is a seedbed, if you will. What we would want to sow within the context of the seminary building is first and foremost um, a deep communion, an intimate communion of life and love with the Lord himself. Well, the parable ends with those beautiful words, uh, some seed fell on good ground. I think that the Lord continues to pour down abundant blessings upon us. And uh, I think that some of those blessings come in form of uh, young men who are ready to go off to seminary and commit their lives to uh, priestly ministry, to faithful discipleship and leading God's people. Watch over, O Lord, your church in Edmonton and Western Canada, which has built this new seminary dedicated to St. Joseph to ensure that the future ministers of Christ gathered in common life in the study of your holy teaching will be rightly formed for so great a service. It was an incredibly powerful and moving project and everyone that worked on it back in the office and even the people who worked to construct it really realized this was a special and a different place and, and I think it brought out the best in everyone and I will always remember it. It will always be a part of me, I think. When we toured the facility uh, a few weeks ago, uh, it, it's just an architectural masterpiece and I believe uh, one of its kind and uh, really for, for our archdiocese here in Edmonton and in the uh, province of Alberta. This is going to be a very prominent place to attract uh, people to the seminary, to the priesthood. I'm convinced that the vocations, uh, I was going to say will be there, but they, they are there now. And my conviction is rooted in the fidelity of God to us. So because the Lord is always faithful to his church, the Lord will always be calling and raising up vocations. So we do see signs uh, in many ways of, uh, of great, great hope for the future. But ultimately our hope is rooted in the fidelity of the Lord to us.